Welcome to Creekside Online. Our mission is to reach the world with Jesus one person at a time, with Christ, community, and compassion. We are so glad that you're joining us today. If it was your very first time, please take a moment to click the link below and fill out the online connect card. We would love for you to stay connected throughout the week and everywhere you go. And the best way to do that is through our church app. There you can watch additional messages and find resources to help you grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's free and you can download it wherever you download your apps. For us, church is much more than just a weekend experience. And we want you to know that there's a place perfect for you at Creekside. No matter where you're watching today, let's get ready for what God has in store for us. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for making your home in us. That is an amazing thought that the God of the universe would want to be that deeply in fellowship with us. Thank you for being our Father. And Father, we know that wherever you are, there's victory and there's life. So Father, whatever's happened in the past week, Lord, may we surrender to you. May we, may we sense your victory is ahead. May we continue in your strength. Help us, Father, to just lean into you, to invite you to fellowship with us more often. Help us, Lord, to just sit in thankfulness like we are right now on a more regular basis. Just live that life of thanksgiving that you've called us to. You've done so much for us and in us. Thank you for cleansing us continually, making us more like your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for we all can find things to be thankful for, and we do that right now. We thank you most just for our salvation in Jesus and the resurrection from the dead that is our hope. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank all of you for being here, and we look forward to Thanksgiving. Anybody here excited about Thanksgiving? few people. I'm honest to everybody. Yeah, I'm excited. Man, one of my favorite, favorite times. I mean, really, it's just uh, brings back so much memory, so much nostalgia. And we're getting ready for Christmas, of course, and already the Christmas decorations out and everything like that. And we're even doing that here at the church. You might have noticed the Christmas trees there. Those Christmas trees are there for a reason. This is kind of a toy drive that we have every year. And it's for a very down and out, one of the poorest of the poor here in Jacksonville is the Myanmar uh, refugees. They're persecuted Christians uh, who came over to the United States, one of the most persecuted groups there for the last 50 years. They've been persecuted in China. They've come over here, and we do toy drives for them. We care for them. We support them. Safe Havens helps us in uh, with that. Our Safe Havens ministry is part of our missions ministry. And I just want to encourage you, church, keep up that wonderful, amazing giving. You're giving to missions. You can go online. You can find all our missions that we support. I encourage you to to not just support them physically and tangibly with your resources, but also with your prayers. We know they need your prayers. And church, keep rising up. That tree is out there. You can pick uh, gifts to, to choose for those. They're basically used, looking for gently used new uh, or new gifts and toys, of course, for them. So they give you some ideas out there. So we're beginning today, and it's going to be the final collection day on December 11th. And, of course, you can go on your apps or, or information, find information on our website to find more about that. But let's, let's start in prayer again as we pray to God with thanksgiving for all he's done through our mission work. Father, thank you for these folks here who've given so generously to you, either whether they're here in the building or online. They've been just so generous to see and want your kingdom to advance and, and Father, we pray that these children will be blessed, uh, who we give to, and their parents will be blessed, that they will sense your presence, and that they will use these things to spread your joy to more and more people who don't know about your son, Jesus Christ. That is our purpose. That is why we know we're here. And Father, we know that you've supplied us with all things so that that message will get out and so that none might perish, but all may come to have life eternal with you. And Father, I pray that you would help us now to hear your voice as we study your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, today is a, 
uh, a different kind of message. I do these kind of two or three times a year where I basically break into what Creekside's all about, our mission, our vision, where we've been, where we're going. And uh, so if you're a guest here today, it's kind of us just kind of opening the kitchen uh, sink and showing you everything. And we hope by the end, of course, you'll, you'll want to be a part of this exciting thing that's going on because God has done some amazing and huge and big things through his people here, the vision of the eldership, the vision of the leaders, uh, the vision of you. We have listened intently to you as God, we, we believe God works through his people to share with us his revelation, his desires for how he wants to reach this community that's all around us. One of my favorite quotes, and I had had picked this out as my favorite quotes from the time of 20, and I've constantly heard it from other people, is Robert Kennedy And I don't know what you think about Robert Kennedy, but regardless, his quote was amazing. Some people see things that are and ask why. I see things that never were and ask why not. Why not? One of the reasons you're here is because some people said, hey, there's people moving in from all over the world. 20 years ago, we said people moving in from all over the world down to this area. And there's nothing but dirt roads down here. But we believe God wants us to do something here. We see something that is not yet but could be. And so here you are. Here you are. The vision is so important. We know from Proverbs, it says without a vision, the people, what? Perish. Proverbs 29, 18, depending on what version that you read it, a vision is so important because without a clear vision, our energies and our thoughts and our actions and our behaviors and our our characters and our attitudes goes in all kinds of different places. Because other versions of Proverbs 29, 18 reads this way, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. They cast off restraint. They they start functioning outside of the boundaries. But happy is he who keeps the law. So you function within God's framework of God says, I have designed each one of you for a specific purpose. And I have a great vision for you individually as well as collectively when you come together here. We have constantly said and preached and we've seen it happening in people as they understand this that there is an individual vision for you, that you would have an obvious overflow of Jesus Christ, his Holy Spirit in your life. That can happen. That can happen as sure as America happened, as sure as the United States got started, right? You think about this amazing story of these pilgrims who have this vision. They're going to cross this sea, 102 of them, on this common cargo ship, And they go for, what was it, 65 days or or more, 65-day journey, and two of them die on the way. But then they land, and within a year, more than half of them died of disease. And yet the remaining ones stayed strong. They stayed there. And fortunately, the Wampanoag tribe helps them. They've come alongside of them. And and, uh, Abraham Lincoln discovered, as well as America since, we celebrate Thanksgiving partly because they had a three-day feast. They had turkey and venison and rabbit and all that stuff that I really love. I hope you get the chance to have some of that stuff, that wild game out there. But they brought that all together. They had a wonderful celebration together. They gave thanks, and they did wonderful things. And then they built a wonderful fortified town. And in the next year, after a year after that, the second year we discovered that they voted on a town council. You need some leadership in a town to tell you what to do, right? To help you see a vision. I mean, the Bible even says you need government leadership going on there. And then we know in the next year, the third year, the council, the town council proposed a road five miles out to the west that they would start looking to expand, right? Do you know in the fourth year, that same group of people, those 50 people that that basically had a vision to go all the way across the ocean, to do all this, to risk their lives, that same group of people wanted to impeach that town council for having a reckless uh, use of their funds and, and their energies. How does that happen? Well, because there is what they call mission drift and vision drift. 
Nehemiah, we know, set a vision and out before the people every 26 days. It's important because we all need a clear vision of what God has designed us to be. We need to keep that in our forefront. Otherwise, we cast off restraint. We start coloring outside the guidelines that God has given us. And so what are these things that God has put before us? It's very important because I think that, that this vision that God has put out before us must never be lost. It started 20 years ago. I shared the story how we said faith, hope, and love. Faith deals with the present and the future. That's what we all move forward with. We're broken. We're not perfect people. We know we needed God's grace. And man, every year we were seeing baptisms like crazy, just as we're seeing now. God's doing amazing things. But from the beginning, our core DNA that was so important was this great faith for what God could do in imperfect people. You know that? We just went through Ephesians, Ephesians 3, 20 through 21. You remember that scripture? It says God is able to do immeasurably beyond all you ask or imagine. We all know that. We cling to that first part. Yeah, our, my God is so big. He created a billion galaxies out there. We can see him. I know how big God is. He holds all things together by his powerful word. But we forget the next phrase. God is able to do immeasurably beyond all we ask or imagine according to his power at work within us. So the question is, how much have you made yourself available for his power to work within you? And that's kind of the attitude that we had at the very beginning. We wanted to stretch and do great big things for God that only if he got involved would it happen, would it occur. <laughs> Man, it was more in some of the leaders around me than it was in me. I had one guy, Glenn Smith, came in my house one day. And he basically said, you know how many acres you want us to find? I said, what? You know, we're... Only a few months old. Shouldn't we wait a little bit longer? No, I'm going to go out and I'm, we're going to start looking. We need some land. I said, well, man, could we even afford five or ten acres in this market? I mean, it was the beginning of 2000. The market was on fire like it was here the last couple of years here. Could we even afford that? I said, five or maybe ten. Okay, ten acres. He said, I'll look for 20. And he went out looking for 20. You know, within eight months, God gave us 40 acres that you're sitting on right now. Do you understand when you stretch in faith, God says sometimes, I want to do even bigger than what you can imagine. And I'm going to do that if you surrender yourself fully to me. So as we think about our vision going into this next year, how does God want you to stretch? How does, want you, how does he want you to reach out and love? How does he want you to move forward in faith, hope, and love. Last fall, our elders and staff got together and we began thinking intentionally. In fact, we all read this book called Intentional Churches. Church OS, some of you may have heard about it. And we studied the parable of the talents again because that's a, such an important story in the Bible to us. Matthew 25 is this parable about three guys. And one was given basically one bag of gold, the other two bags of gold, and the other five bags of gold. Well, when the master, the owner, gets back, these guys are to manage it well and to help his kingdom. It's all representative of God's kingdom and what he's entrusted to us, everything that we own, the air that we breathe, the time that we have. I don't know if you know this or not, but it's all his. It's all his. He's entrusted us with it. He wants us to use it wisely. And when the master gets back, he's not very happy with one guy. It wasn't the five-talent guy. The five-talent guy, see, he gave me five. I produced five more. I produced ten. Then the, the guy that had two, he said, you know, see the two I had? I didn't look at the five-guy guy. I didn't, I didn't compare myself to the five-talent guy. He said, why didn't you give me five bags of gold? He didn't do that. He said, okay, I'm thankful for what you give me. I'm going to take this. I'm going to double it. I'm going to expand it. And the master said, well done. That's our representation of what God's going to say to us someday. When, when everything's unfold, he's going to say, this is what I gave you. And what'd you do with it? We don't want to be like the one talent guy, right? He compared himself probably to the two talent and the five talent guy. He felt uh, slighted. He was selfish. He was lazy, it says. He's also fearful. And so he buried that thing. He buried it in his resentment, see. And when the master came back, he said, well, here's your talent. I'll give it back to you. He said, you wicked, wicked lazy, slothful, sir. You, you will depart. You will not spend eternity with me. See, God looks very seriously at our time, our talents, how much we're available to him. 
And so we looked at that parable a year ago. We said, you know, we believe God's done so much already. God wants us to do even more. And for the next five, five, eight years, whatever it is, we've seen what he did in the last five, eight years of planning, how we stretched and how we wanted to impact his kingdom. We believe he's wanting to do even more. And so basically we came out with the phrase double kingdom impact. We want to do the double talents again. We want to double whatever God has given us right now. We want to double it in the next five years. Double kingdom impact. We want to go beyond these walls, though. That's what we know for sure to the 80,000 reasons. We had done a study eight years ago. A firm came in and they said, man, this area is growing 23% a year. Where there's dirt roads, there's going to be four-lane highways. We know that right now, right? It used to be Russell Sampson Road, a dirt road just about six, seven years ago. It's now a four-lane highway. It, they told us all this was happening. 23% growth you're going to have per year. And by the year 2020, you're going to have 80,000 people. So at that time, we said, we got to reach them. The Lord's put them out there. We're going to do our best to take our chunk and we know we're going to need other churches to take their chunk, but we're going to do our best to take our chunk to reach those 80,000 people. And so even in the midst of COVID, <laughs> we said, God still wants us to be on mission. And last year in December, we put that sign out, shine. That sign's going to go away. But I want you to tell you what that sign did. You all responded to that in great faith. It was wonderful. You wrote your names on many of those light bulbs. We saw the baptistry water stir within weeks of some of you putting the names of the people on there so that you would begin praying for them. And some of you have been praying for those people all year. And some of you jumped on board real quick, too, with Bless Every Home. We talked to you about God bless every home. And you jumped on board with that. We're thankful for that, for all of your prayers and all of your work. We want to tell you God's going to do even more amazing things. I want to look at a kind of a one year in review and then a five year in review just to show you what God has done through a little bit of prayer and a little bit of faith. I mean, you think about Omicron was had hit my wife and I in the first quarter. I know hit many of you in the first quarter. But in the last 11 months, it's still amazing what God did through your faith. We've had 58 baptisms. We've had over 110 transfers. We have 148 first-time givers in, that have come on board in the last 11 months. Praise God. Keep, keep giving like you're giving. You'll see how faithful God is. We've had six students commit to full-time vocational ministry. Friends, that's multiplication. That's multiplication for the kingdom, not just addition. When people go into ministry and say, I want to be a missionary. By the way, all of us are, are missionaries. Did you know that? There's paid staff and unpaid staff. That's the basic thing of it. You can reach people. You're rubbing shoulders with people that I can never reach. They trust you where they don't trust me. They don't have a relationship with me. God has called you to touch them with the love of Jesus Christ, to be his hands and his feet. We had over 20 students baptized again. And, and with our world increasingly being more hostile to Christianity, have you noticed that? Have you felt it in the last couple of years? And it is. I'm proud of you parents who've, who've stepped up and you've hit that resource wall that the Kids Zone has provided, our children's ministry, our family ministry has provided. You're looking for those resources and you applaud your kids when they come out of there and they're not talking about the fun games that they've had all the time. They're talking about the memory verses and, and you're encouraging them in that and you're, you're reinforcing that memory work that they've had, God's word, God's vision, God's law, so that they'll not color outside of his a vision for their lives. I'm proud of you. Keep it up. It is challenging times. But man, we've had nine kids baptized in this last year through your involvement as parents and training them up and our church's involvement in that. We've had 21 people finish Discover Creekside, which is fantastic. It's fantastic. They finished this class, Discover Creek. So it's an amazing class. I encourage every one of you to go to it because there's like four dozen people who are still yet to complete it. But I just mentioned 21 who completed it. But it's basically why Jesus, why the Bible, why church, and why baptism. And those are very important questions, some of the most important questions for your life. And Chad Boer does a fantastic job of laying it out and showing us how God can use each one of us, just like he used the Samaritan woman. Man, he meets her. God comes to start his ministry right with her, and he meets her in a forbidden territory, really kind of for the Jews. Then they didn't pass through Samaria. He meets her in the middle of the day. He has an appointment with her. 
And was she just this radiant, beautiful, uh, Mary the mother of Jesus type woman? Man, as far away from that as she could possibly be, right? Jesus reveals to her that he knows all about her. She's been married five times and she's living with somebody now. Look for love in all the wrong places. And guess what? She becomes his very first evangelism, evangelist to a lost village of Samaria. That's the power of God's work in a life. An overflow, an obvious overflow that he wants in us. No matter who we are, we have an impact for his kingdom for eternity, friends. And you've been doing that. I'm so proud of you. You know, in the last year through Bless Every Home, B-E-H, it's on the screen, I think. Over 26,000 prayers have been recorded through you to, to seeking an overflow of God's Spirit to just wash over this area. A sea of love and forgiveness and grace. You know, forgiveness is so sweet. It's like that song says, like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Forgiveness that we offer to other people through Jesus Christ. The fruit of lips that praise his name. We can offer him. It's so incredible. And you've offered up 26,000 prayers that God would sweep over. What happens is you go to this app and you adopt a home. And after adopting that home, you start praying for those. And then you record it. Every day, it gives you an email and a suggested prayer over five of those names, of those homes that you've adopted. Many people adopt 20 or 40. Do you know you as a church have adopted 3,301 homes? Praise God. Can we give a hand to God for that, what he's doing through you as a church? 3,301 homes you've adopted. And I believe directly as a result of that, we've had more guests in this last 11 months we've ever had, more than 1,000 guests. And we know that people don't come two, three times a month anymore like they used to. Kind of, we're heading into kind of a post-Christian era here in America. They come about one time a month or one time a quarter. So those people are coming back. And that's why we know probably sometime next year we're going to probably have to have a third service here and more small groups and God is calling all of us to step up. Twelve couples participated in a marriage mentoring program. If you go to our caring tab on our website, you'll notice there's divorce care, grief share. There's all kinds of mentoring that happens, all kinds of wonderful ministry care. And we're going to break that out even some more this morning as we talk about care. Well, that's the last year. What about the last five years? Well, 80,000 Reasons Five-Year Impact Report is amazing. You know, God sometimes does less than we think we can do in a year, but he does more than you ever thought in five years. We built, in the last five years, a 30,000-square-foot building, and, and we weren't in it when COVID hit, and yet God helped us complete that. We started a preschool to reach them. Praise the Lord. We doubled our missions giving to reach people locally and globally, and that is just phenomenal going from 100,000 to over 200,000 to reach people around the globe. We invested heavily in a missional focus as well as an online and sports outreach. We want to go beyond these walls. And so we hired staff accordingly to go beyond these walls. We, our core team is intensifying in their passion to reach everybody beyond these walls. And in the next five years, we want to have these big God-sized goals that are going to honor God again. That if God doesn't get involved, like he did when I thought, oh, 10 acres and the other guy 20. And if God doesn't get involved, we're going to fall flat on our face. But we want to have God honoring goals. We want goals. We want to hear from you goals that are so big that they, they just kind of make you quake a little bit. Because if God doesn't get involved, we're going to fall flat on our face. And we need your involvement in that. So on December 11th, mark it on your calendar. We'd love to have you RSVP. You got our RSVP and come out for a ministry leader luncheon. If you know you have a spiritual gift of leadership or administration, we'd love to have you come and share your ideas. We know this. One of our major goals in the next five years is to fully utilize Bless Every Home in every way. Where we got 26,000 prayers. We want that much prayer, much, much more. We want to double that next year. And we want to have 10,000 cares. That's the next thing level you go. 
go to, where we want to see at least 100 people here every week giving one act of care to their neighbors to show the love of Jesus Christ, to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. So that by the end of the year, at this time next year, we'll be celebrating 10,000 times we've touched our neighbors and our co-workers with the love of Jesus Christ through our eyes and our hands. That's a big goal. And, and believe me, when we move it out to the five-year point, I'll give you that after we get input from the December 11th meeting, it's going to be huge. But we also know we probably need just, we need two at least to start big Hairy, audacious goals, if you know what I'm talking about, that, that would honor God. And so that's why we're welcoming your input on that December 11th meeting. And what we want to see in 2023 is just this care beyond the walls, where you're walking neighborhoods, praying for neighbors. But one, of the, one of the guys that's on staff right now, I got to know him about a year and a half ago, and he was amazing because it's basically he was just walking his neighborhood. He was having Bible studies with his neighbors. And he was just coming to church here, but he was already doing that and just sharing love. He showed me on the app, Bless Every Home, and he says, see here, Chuck, this is what I do. I meet these people, and then as I meet them, I get to know where they are spiritually, and so I'm able to determine whether they are, they, they, they're an atheist, they have no knowledge about Jesus, and I can pray about that specifically, or where they have some knowledge about Jesus, or whether they are already been shared up and, and discipled, and whether they're active, so that, so that I, I know they're in a fold somewhere. And, and I do that, and then I have these fellowship times. And he, he mapped all this out, and I thought, I need a guy like that on staff, don't you think? <laughs> when you got somebody already doing the stuff we want everybody doing, that God has called all of us to do. It's a fantastic, fantastic thing. So I hope that you'll be praying for us. That's really what we, what we want. But more importantly, that you'll stay active with blessing every home in this area, going beyond these walls to the 80,000 reasons. Now, if you will, if you have your Bibles, you turn with me to Matthew chapter 9. We're going to start with verse 9 today. It's the calling of Matthew. He's a man much like the men in our, and men and women in our 904 area here, right? The First Coast region. This is who Matthew is. He's wealthy. He looks good on the outside, but on the inside, he's empty. In fact, we talk about people here in this region as a, we know that behind these walls of these huge houses is a lot of hidden brokenness. Hidden brokenness. In fact, I had, a, I had a leader meeting. I do SALT meeting, servant and leader training meeting twice a year. would encourage any of you to be a part of that and look for it. But the group of people that we had there, they're like, man, the, the brokenness, it's just all around us. We just had no way. You think everybody's together, but then when they begin sharing, it's just amazing the stuff that they're dealing with. And it's so, so true. Well, guess what? Matthew was a guy just like that. And I love how the Chosen series just kind of, uh, just kind of opens, <laughs> opens his life up and makes it so real. Now, it's not a documentary. It's a docudrama. But I can tell you so many of the ways they portray Matthew after I've studied him in many different books is, is pretty, pretty accurate. Now, maybe the autistic thing, he's a little bit autistic, goes a little bit of extreme, but he's a very sharp person, man. He was so detailed in the book of Matthew. If you haven't read the book of Matthew, I encourage you to read it. It's a very short biography of Jesus' life written by this guy, this down and outer, this broken, wealthy guy who Jesus calls into his fellowship. And as we get into it, you'll see even more how just dis almost disturbing it is that Jesus reaches him. But that's who Jesus is, which gives us all hope that we can be included in his kingdom and be bringers and includers too, like Jesus was and like Matthew was. Let's watch as we see uh, just a summary of how the last two years chosen has broken Matthew's life down. How can you not have a relationship with your father? He says he has no son. Your father would sooner die than take your blood, mother. It's quite common. The mother of a son with talent like yours should be proud. Even the rabbis were astonished at your talent for reading, math. We could think faster than any other child. They thought you would be someone great. Great at what? I'm rich. 
I have an armed escort. I'm trusted by the Praetor of Galilee. We never dreamed you would use the talent God gave Against you. Against God. You're good at something. You found a way to make a living doing it. Admire it. It's that simple. Keenly intelligent. It's your reactions to the world I love. There is a situation. A mob in these slums. I'm coming with you. Excuse me? I'm coming with you. Matthew, I do not have time to protect you. Should I have a weapon? I just wanted to hear the teacher teach. Okay, come on. Get yourself in. You have your feasible plan. I just told you my plan. If I'm going down, it will be doing what God bid me to do. You're making a mistake. You can walk away from this. I need my choice. Matthew. Matthew, son of Alpheus. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you doing? Keep moving, street preacher. Follow me. Yes, you. Do you have any idea what this guy's done? You see, you are alone. Do you even know? Yes. I am reviewing applications for a new public harness for the district. Why are you doing that? Listen, I said to Matthew left. What are you doing? Guys, let me go. If you've lost your wife, you have money. Quintus, protection. No Jew is as good as you. I'm gonna throw it all away. Yes. You know, Matthew, when you're not behind iron bars, you're quite handsome. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Are you gonna wear that? These are my clothes. Should I have others? And the Chosen App series is trying to show us if God could choose these ordinary, common, broken, outcast type of guys to follow him he wants to choose every one of us to do these things and even greater things is what he says in scriptures than they did he can do it through each and every one of you so if you have a friend that doesn't know about Jesus it's going to hit the theaters this season three I encourage you to invite your friends to come with you to the theaters there's all kinds of ways in which you can lead somebody to Jesus, just as Matthew was led to Jesus. We often forget there's so many backstories and details to these disciples. And man, it's very clear that, man, Peter was most likely to push Matthew around, just as we saw. Simon the Zealot likely wanted him dead. The Roman soldiers treated him as their toady. I mean, his mother didn't even care about it. His mother and dad wouldn't even fellowship with the tax collectors. We know this from history. So what motivated Matthew to so drastically just leave his wealth. I mean, the first record of him, that verse 9 basically says, Jesus said, come follow me. And he just dropped everything just like that portrayed. And he follows Jesus. What was it? There's something so attractive to Jesus, but also something about Matthew's brokenness, his loneliness, his hurt, his pain that Jesus saw. Even though he looked good on the outside, it made Jesus irresistible. So Matthew dropped everything to follow him. And why did Jesus choose Matthew as one of his children? Did Jesus see him as an asset? Well, we know the disciples were probably like, man, I know you want to draft more people onto this team, but man, that's a loser draft. And he's broken. He's, he's like so many of us. But he has so much to offer the kingdom. 2,000 years later, we're still amazed at the book Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. Did Jesus simply know that Matthew lived his life proud and he was broken inside more than anything else he needed a place to belong? No, I think he knew the kind of person that Matthew would become once he had the fullness of the Holy Spirit in him. And we read what he becomes just a few verses later. Chapter 25, actually, sorry, I jumped ahead here. We read probably what like him. He impacted him to become the person that he became right after Jesus called him out of the tax booth. Man, he had a big party. He thought, I can't just keep this to myself, the goodness of Jesus. i got to have a big party. And we're going to see the amazing people that he invites people to. And we're going to see why he probably wrote in chapter 25. He talked about the parable of the talents, but also chapter 25. Matthew remembers these words. This is Jesus at the end of time 
Verse 34, it gives us an insight to what's going to happen to everybody as they stand before the judgment. Jesus is going to say to some people, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When do we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When do we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. By the way, the brothers and sisters part, he's talking about people of the faith, but he's talking about people that we know that he wants in the faith. They often come to the faith because of the love that they see in us. When they see that we are treating them as we would treat Jesus, they want what we have. I was a stranger, Jesus said, and you invited me in. Friends, this world needs to see less of the criticism of Christianity and more of the care of Christianity. In fact, I would suggest that outside these walls, I hope that Creekside will become known in the next five years as one of the most caring churches in the world. Because Jesus' care lives deep in your heart. You remember that phrase in that movie, that clip there? I'm not welcome at dinner parties. Even my own parents don't want me. He wasn't welcome anywhere. Not until Jesus came along. Maybe it's why he remembered so well Jesus' words in Matthew 25. I was a stranger and you invited me in. And he's a broken stranger to dis- disciples, to, to himself, for good reason. I mean, he kind of sold his soul. <laughs> his job was about extorting the hard-earned wages in his fellow countrymen. The Romans wanted somebody that would kind of be traitors to their own people but knew the language, and so they promised them wealth. They said you had to make a certain amount of money, but then beyond that, you could go ahead and conscribe. Basically, you can write your own salary, whatever you wanted, and they would cheat people in their taxes. They went around with knives. They could literally cut the bag of, of people's people kept their purse strings on their, on their outside. They could literally cut the bag and see how much money they still had them if, if they hadn't paid their taxes. And as Matthew's salary grew larger and larger, his values continued to slide. His list of friends, acquaintances grew smaller day by day. He looked good on the outside, but inside he's full of dead man's bones. Matthew gave Jesus a try, though. Because of this hole in his heart. He invited Jesus into his home. And friends, I would just encourage you. If you're thinking about Jesus, if you're at least open to him, good for you. Or if if you're even an atheist, could I just challenge you? Just give him a try. Just invite him into your home a little bit. Maybe read the book of Matthew. What do you got to lose? came this person that was so in love with Jesus after inviting him into his home that he had to bring others in along with him as well. I know that's hard to imagine. You yourself maybe have a hard time thinking about Jesus in your home. But I pray if you really dive in deep to Jesus, I pray you'll do that. And you'll find that he gives you the strength, the energy, the joy to let it overflow to others. Verse 10 says, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors came and ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Tax collectors. Again, thought to be lepers and prostitutes of Jesus' day. Who else would be Matthew's friends except those people? He had lost his family. He had lost everybody else. But fellow 
tax collectors. They'll come to this party. And maybe even some of these other people that society calls sinners too that I could hang out with and feel some kind of camaraderie with. Friends, those type of people are all around us, even today. My wife had some work people years ago. We challenged our congregation to have Thanksgiving caregiving meals like a week or two before Thanksgiving, where you invite coworkers over and neighbors over. And we invited them over, and and we were just going to talk and fellowship, do some games. But I said, I want to do one thing right before we pray for the meal. I just want to say, is there anything I can pray for? I'm telling you, the food almost got cold because the people had stuff on their hearts that was big. And there were tears shed. Man, I'll never forget that. The hidden brokenness is so real all around us if we just care. That's who Jesus would hang out with today. The ones who need him the most. The ones who feel like the pieces are all over the floor the vase, the dreams that they had, and now he's going to help them pick those pieces up and make something more beautiful in his time if they let him, if they're open to him. And Matthew wanted his co-workers to know the beauty that was beginning to form in his life. And so he just couldn't hold it in. He had to invite him to a Matthew party. And so we want to encourage you to have neighborhood parties, Matthew parties, these next five years. Go beyond these walls. All it is is caring and praying and watch the adventures that begin to happen in your life. We were eating at a restaurant the other day. I was with one of my friends in the congregation. And uh, we were impressed with this young man, how he was serving us so well. And um, after a while, as, as I do, I don't make it obnoxious, but I always try to kind of say, what's going on in your life? Is there something I can pray for you kind of thing? But th- for this particular guy, I just felt like I could skip that part and jump right to, do you have a church home? He said, well, yeah, kind of right now I'm, I'm visiting between Creekside Christian Church and uh, Hope, Hopewell Church. I said, boy, Hopewell's a great church. I hope you can come here. By the way, I'm a minister. At Creekside, he kind of looked at me strange. I'm thinking, ah, gotcha. And then he was like, no, I'm part of the student ministry. You know, that's, it. that's how I had it. Friends, you don't know. Everybody you meet is on a journey. And God calls some of us to come alongside of those people, to reach out to them and invite them in, to be bringers and includers. Man, Matthew, he calls his co-workers, and they were some of the messiest Sinners there were, and you know Jesus was totally fine with that. Who would Jesus go to today? We'd raise our eyebrows at those that Jesus would visit. The parties that he would go to. People with questionable character to meet those people. Remember what Matthew said, Jesus said in Matthew 25 again, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. Lord, when did we do that? As often as you did it for one least of these, brothers of mine, everybody's a potential future family member in the body here. And so we're to invite them in so that they're not strangers anymore and befriend them to associate with them. Your neighbor, your work associate, may seem wealthy, have it all together, but I guarantee you there's some brokenness there if you listen to their story. You wonder why God seems distant to you sometimes when you pray to him? Where is God when you need him most? Friends, maybe he's right next door. (laughs) In the person you most need, because he said, well, I was a stranger and you invited me in. Maybe the Lord is right next door to you. I swam, I, I swim rather at the at the YMCA a couple weeks ago. I'm always my wife says this strange things happen, and she's right. She said, you know, women they talk so easily and everything. She said, but when we get in the sauna, everybody's quiet. I said, that's weird. It's not like the men. For some reason, I don't know. I guess you know, I told you weeks ago that uh, I never liked wrestling. I'd never get that close to a sweaty man, right? But you know, and so we do keep our distance there. We definitely everybody's sweating. I guess we got to say something to each other while we're sweating to death. So men do talk, and I've been amazed at the friendships that happen there. 
you know, and for the opportunities for friendships that happen. I had a Korean guy I was talking to the other day, and I was like, man, I just, you know, by the end of the conversation, I had invited him to the church here, and, uh, and I told him that we have several folks that used to be in Korea. We, we had a missionary from Korea. Actually, I, said, I told him about uh, Jay Lee, who was a Buddhist and was converted. He worked down uh, for the, the, on the Mars uh, NASA program and went over to Mongolia as a missionary. He came back, told him all about him. And he, he realized that Creekside was a wonderful, welcoming place. Friends, this is who we're called to be. Bringers and includers to the strangers of the gospel. We're to look out for the left out. The disciples, they struggled with Matthew. Well, no wonder. I just want you to put yourself in the disciples' shoe. How would you feel if suddenly your boss had you sitting next to the latest person arrested on the nightly news? How would you feel if you were sitting next to a politician who'd swindled some money. Think about it. What's your reaction when a new neighbor comes in and they have these loud Latino parties at night? Or they're all wearing flowing robes as they go on walks and you notice that their wife and daughter have dots on their foreheads and they live right next door. And by the way, they do. Our preschool has like 25%. India folks. We, I just talked to a family uh, that, that came this morning. Actually, two, three families. How do you feel? How, how do you reach out to them? Do, do you welcome them as Jesus welcomed Matthew? As Matthew wanted his friends to meet Jesus? Is, is that the caring mindset that you have? If you're in school and a new student transfers into your class, man, can you imagine how hard that would be to show up in mid-year in a classroom full of strangers? What about the new employee at work that has different interests than you and different, they come from a different race, you notice that their English is broken and they're left out. Jesus said I was a stranger and you invited me in. That meant a lot to Matthew. That should mean a lot to you. Jesus went to the outcast. And the Pharisees, of course, they criticized it. Those that felt that they were righteous, right? And Jesus' last words to them were, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You missed me completely, my heart and my will. The Bible says no one is righteous. We're all sinners. We're really all strangers to God. For what he once had in mind for us, you see. He had in mind for us a certain thing through our DNA and Adam and Eve. We're all strangers. We're far from what he created us to be. But in Jesus, we can come back to that. And we can be the people that God created us to be. And he wants us to show others how to become that. How to have the overflow of his Holy Spirit in our life. He wants us to be more like doctors than judges. Really caring for people, seeing people's spiritual heart needs. And guess what? If you listen enough, you'll pick up on it. I had a guy in Tuesday Bible study call me out. He says, did you pick up? It wasn't the words that he said. It was what was going on behind. I didn't pick it up. I missed it. I wasn't listening hard enough. We know that the ones who refused to believe that they themselves needed a doctor, that they needed to grow. They were the ones beyond Jesus' reach. They were the ones that he didn't use like he did Matthew. I wonder if we could, just in this next year, to begin to develop eyes to see like Jesus. Like a friend of, a pastor friend of mine, Ben Woods, to see like he and his wife Crystal saw. He said, Ben preached a powerful sermon about pain and loss in the church. He came to visit me. How to work through your grief. Their daughter, Kayla, got sick a couple years ago. He said she was just nine years old when she was rescued to heaven. See, one of the things that this preacher, Ben and Crystal, have tried to do is go around helping other churches see in the spiritual realm. And they also try to help families 
develop a culture that will help kids have that eternal nature in them. He said it's almost like giving our kids liturgy, specific sayings that help their families move forward on mission together. What we might call compassion actions is what we call it. At the end of every sermon, I give you a compassion action to take. Well, Ben said five or six years ago, he was taking Kayla. At that time, she was seven years old. Remember, she died at nine. Their routine was that they would pray together on the way to school, and they would take turns. One day, he would pray. The next day, she would pray. He said one morning, they were at Carver Street, and Kayla said, Daddy, we should start praying for all the families who live in those houses we're driving by. Seven years old. So that's what they did. They started praying in those families. They would wonder who lived in those homes. They would make up stories, perhaps, about how lonely they were, how much they needed Jesus. And then Bed said it was like Jesus tapped them on the shoulder and gave them this phrase, look out for the left out. Think about that. How many people step into each day feeling overlooked, feeling isolated, on the outside, looking in? How can we look out for the left out? Well, Kayla loved that. She embraced it. For the two remaining years of her life, it was her sacred text. And do you know in the Midwest and all through Indiana in their schools, they bought t-shirts that have look out for the left out on them on Kayla's birthday. Those schools in those areas still celebrate her eyes, her vision, which was Jesus' eyes and Jesus' vision. And they say, let's look out for the left out. Friends, I'm asking you, will you join us? Jesus said, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Sinners. I'll say with Paul, I'm one of the greatest there is. I pray that you realize out of your brokenness that Jesus gives you life and you need to, to see that, that other people in your sphere of influence that don't know him get to meet him. And maybe this next year you'll have some Matthew parties too. Let's pray. Father, you're so, so good to us. We don't deserve your grace, your love, your kindness to us. But Father, we know that it's your will, without a doubt, to reach these 80,000 people all around us who've come from New York and California and Hawaii and Washington, Minnesota, and just all over the place, Canada. And Father, we... There's not a lot of people with roots here that can welcome into their infrastructures. But Lord, we have the infrastructure of your kingdom. And so help us to have eyes that see and minds that receive and hearts that care. Help us to be your hands and feet, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We hope the message you just listened to had an impact on you. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week online at creeksidechristian.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Creekside Christian Church. We believe God has something unique to say to you, and our hope is that you feel His love stronger today than ever before. We love you, and we'll see you next time.